Thank you all for coming, and uh, thanks for indulging me in English. If I had to do this talk in Russian, it would be a very short talk. Um, you'll decide afterwards if that's a good thing or not. So, um, I'm Phil Nash, as, as I've been introduced. You can find me on Twitter here. I am also developer advocate here at JetBrains, although I don't work in this office. Obviously, I'm remotely uh, in the UK. So I'm developer advocate for the C++ tools, C Lion, and uh, ReSharp for C++, uh, and to some extent, app code. So if you do have any you know, questions about that, feel free to speak to me afterwards. But of course, you have no shortage of JetBrains employees here, so I feel that's not an issue for you. But we're not going to talk about JetBrains products tonight. We're going to talk about error handling. So my uh, talk title, Dawn of a New Era, obviously a bit of a play on words. Um, not the first time I've done that, as you'll see. But the, uh, the background image here, which you've noticed this nicely animating in, is actually from the, uh, the, the JetBrains um, the winter getaway in Munich uh, last year. This is the view from the hotel room. I thought it was really nice, so I thought it'd make a perfect um, uh, backdrop to, to represent the dawn of something new. Um, but I want to start with a little bit of history. Um, at least the history of error handling in C++. Uh, before we do that, this is really what we're going to be talking about. This is going to be the focus of tonight. This proposal, uh, P0709, zero overhead deterministic exceptions throwing values. We're going to dig into exactly what that means and what this is. Um, who here is uh, at least somewhat familiar with this proposal already? Uh, a few hands, but uh, most, people, most people not, so that's, that's good. You should learn something. Um, interestingly, before we talk about what this is all about, I moved house just recently, in fact, just last month. And when I moved in, I um, had to take meet, uh, readings from the gas meter to send to the energy provider so they knew what to, to charge me. And I do what I always do, which is to take a photo of the readings so I can more easily write them down. Um, and I noticed something amusing, which is that it's 0709. In fact, not just that, but if you go back, we've got the, um, this is revision two. Even has the two there, how about that? So nothing to do with the talk, I just thought it was quite amusing. Um, slightly more seriously, this is not the first talk I've done on this subject. You can see this is like, playing on my mind. Um, I've been talking about this sort of stuff for a couple of years now. So you may have seen me do this talk before. In fact, I think I did it. Um, in the, the old JetBrains office, the other side of town, last year. Optional is not a failure. Let's say another play on the words. Um, in fact, even this one was not the, the first talk I've done by this name. Earlier the same year, I did this talk. So same name, optional is not a failure. This is at App DevCon, which is a mobile developers conference. This was in the context of Swift, not a C++ talk at all. But we use the same title because it's basically the same subject. In fact, what, I had, what had occurred to me is that Swift actually has what I consider to be one of, if not the, best error handling strategies of any language, which is quite a bold statement. And I felt that the Swift community, many of them didn't fully appreciate that, so I wanted to um, tell them what I thought about it. And as I was thinking about that, I was reading the tea leaves, looking ahead, thinking, we're sort of at the start of a similar transition in C++. Maybe we have the same you know, end goal. So I wanted to bring those thoughts to the C++ community as well. So I started working on a C++ talk of the same name to, to present these ideas and say, this is where I think we should be going. And before I actually presented the talk, I then became aware of what is now P0709, the, the paper by Herb Sutter. It didn't have a paper number at the time, hadn't actually been published. Uh, and I realized when I read it, it was talking about exactly the same thing. P0709 is effectively swift error handling in C++. Some nuances, but the core of it is that. So that's an interesting parallel, and that, we'll come back to that a little bit. But this is not the first time I thought about alternate error handling strategies in C++ or any other language. Uh, probably the first one, I looked at was something called exploding return types. Who here has heard of or used exploding return types? One hand. 
It's usually one or two, if that. That's probably a good thing, for reasons that we'll see. It's an interesting idea, though. I first heard about it, I think, trying to piece the pieces together after the fact, from this ACCU uh, conference talk from 2007, from Andre Alexandrescu. Choose your poison. Exceptions or error codes. Right in the title there, it says what the, the motivation for this is. We have these trade-offs between exceptions and error codes. And we don't always want to make that trade-off straight away. And it's a shame we even have to make the trade-off. And his observation was, often you want to make that trade-off, if at all, at the call site, rather than in a, a function that implements it. And we usually do it at the implementation level. So his suggestion was this, this library he was presenting to allow us to defer that to the call site. And the way he did that was with this template uh, called likely t. And there's a couple of interesting aspects to this. Uh, one of them is that this template would hold either an object of type t, the thing you actually wanted, or an exception that represented what went wrong. And the, the bit that, was, that made it a, an exploding return type was this part. If you haven't checked it by the time it goes out of scope, in its destructor, it will throw the exception, hence the exploding return type. And the idea is to force you to actually check the, the, uh, the error code before you, um, or rather than just ignoring it completely. That's the exploding part. Now, if that like, gives you a, a bad feeling, uh, you're probably right. Even back then, we were discouraging people from throwing exceptions from destructors. But this seemed like, if you pardon the pun, an exceptional case. Um, I actually played with this a bit. Uh, and of course, when C11 came along, because this is 2007, uh, where destructors are no accept by default, that started to bite us. And I had to rip some of that out of our code base because I just couldn't make it work with, with these no accepts. Even if you do no accept, they're false. Sometimes this doesn't work. So this is the bad idea these days. I actually dug a little bit more and um, traced this idea back to, to the year 2000, uh, this uh, forum posting. Um, somebody uh, presented this, this idea, and you can see here the destructor throwing again if you haven't checked it. Same idea. Um, in fact, this thread even referenced earlier work from Lisa Lippincott and uh, James Cans. And in fact, Lisa actually chimed in on the thread. And I think it's amusing what she said. Bear in mind, year 2000, let's not repeat the mistakes of the past. Model the copy construction and assignment on the current auto pointer and not the old broken one. Real reminder that these were different times back then. But anyway, that aside, C11 came along, exploding return types, not a good idea. But 2012, Alexandrescu comes out with another talk, systematic error handling in C++. And here he presents a, like a variation on the same type. Uh, it's got some of the same ideas, but no longer has the, uh, the throwing destructor. I did manage to find this slide, so I can show it a little bit more clearly here. So it still throws on access if it doesn't contain the actual type. So it still has the exception in there, just not the throwing destructor. But he'd now honed in on what he considered to be the key idea. Because the part where he says it's either a T, the thing he wanted, or the exception preventing its creation. That was really the, the essence of it all along. And the name he gave this one, expected. If that sounds familiar, because there is a proposal, it's been around for a few years now, for stood expected which is based on boost expected, which in turn was based on Alexandrescu's expected. So it's making its way into the standard. Uh, hasn't quite made it in yet, unfortunately. Um, but it has been around for a little while. Interestingly, it's not unique to C++. Uh, types like this are actually quite common in most modern programming languages. Just a handful that I'm fairly familiar with uh, up here. Notice most of them call it something like result except Haskell, which always has to be different and more generic. So it's got the eye of a monad. Um, you can use for exactly the same thing. Everything else is called result, mostly because this is usually intended to be used as a return type for propagating errors on the return channel. Notice Swift is up there. And interestingly, it's only had result as of Swift 5, which came out just last year. Whereas that Swift error handling I was talking about earlier, 
actually came out in Swift 2. And I said I thought that was probably the best error handling strategy of any language, or one of. So why did I only get this in Swift 5? I say that because I think Swift actually got to the end result and leapfrogged over this stepping stone stage of these result types. That's how I consider them. But there, are still, there is still some use for these result types if you need to defer error handling to another point, um, say because of asynchronous uh, programming or um, serialization. Or, there's a few things like that where you may need to, to hold on to it before you evaluate it. So result is still useful. But for general error handling, Swift error handling actually supersedes this before it even came out. That's interesting. We'll come back to this a little bit. But let's actually see some code and some C++ code at that. Here's how you use stood expected in real life. Simple example of a function that takes a string and parses it into an integer. So of course, it may not encode an integer, so we need some error handling. Now, just to highlight the, the important parts, the return type. I favor trailing return types. Obviously, you don't have to write it this way. Um, I just find it clearer. So we're returning, well, we want to return an integer, but we're going to wrap it in a std expected of int or, in this case, std domain error. You can use any type there. It doesn't have to be an exception type. It's often quite convenient. But there's our, um, as we saw earlier, the type we wanted, the integer, or the exception or other error preventing its uh, return. And then in the failure case, we return this std make unexpected, which we can just consider a type of factory function for std expected, um, and otherwise just wraps that error type. And the reason we have make unexpected is just to make overloading nice and clean. So there's, there's no ambiguity on the happy path. We can always just return, in this case, our integer, and there's no overload confusion. That's all that's there for. Pretty simple. Usage, also pretty straightforward, much as you might expect. So uh, we're calling parseInt, and we, we capture the result. We have to capture an intermediate variable here. So we can test it first using the uh, Boolean conversion operator, modeled after std optional, which itself is modeled after pointers. And in the happy path case, we dereference it again, like the std optional model, which is modeled after pointers. So fairly familiar. In fact, the only difference between std expected and std optional in usage is that on the error path, we now have access to this error object, just dot error, and we've got it. And because in this case it's an exception type, we can do dot what on it, but whatever we put in there, we get access to it that way. Nice, simple, straightforward. If you've ever tried to do this with std variant, that's a real pain. This is nice and simple. So that's good. Really easy to understand. So we're done, right? Well, here's the problem. Here's the balance between the happy path and the error path. And it's not good. Even in this tiny example, it's dominated by the error handling. Straightforward enough to follow, but it really gets in the way. And maybe that's just because this is a small example. So let's scale it up a little bit. Let's introduce some more functions with error handling, compose them together. So here's another simple function to divide two integers. And because we want to allow for division by zero, we introduce std ex uh, expected again, same way as before. Um, we're returning std make unexpected. Again, simple, straightforward. And we'll throw one more function in as well. No error handling in this one, just takes and returns an integer, adds one to it. That's it. OK, how, how would we use this? Probably something like this as a first attempt. Just same as we did before, but with nesting. Again, as you read through, it's all perfectly understandable. Nothing complex going on, nothing tricky. It's just a mess. And looking at it at a glance, it's hard to see what the program logic is. It's mostly error handling, boilerplate. That's what's dominating. That's the problem. And even worse, the final stage of the happy path is like nested deep in the middle here. Not really how we want to write code. I mean, we can, but it's, it's not great. Now, in this case, we're returning um, at each point. So we could say, well, let's just use early returns. And it does improve things a little bit, yes. But 
I'm going to stir that again from there to there. Yeah, it's better, but it's, the basic problem is still there. It's, it's not much better. And you can't always use early returns anyway. And this is using like, the, the next generation of error handling in C++. So it's, it's not a good start. But think back for a moment to that slide I showed you with those other languages that use a similar approach. Surely they don't all suffer this problem, do they? Well, of course not. They're not C++. How do they do it? How does Haskell do it, for example? Well, I've said Haskell, so of course I'm going to have to introduce monads. So I'm now going to give a, uh, the rest of the talk would be an introduction to monads. No, not at all, but just kidding. Um, you don't actually have to understand what monads are, although it helps, to know how they might help. And in particular, we have another proposal. This is P0798, monadic operations for std optional. Why am I talking about std optional here? Well, we actually want to talk about std expected, but that's not in the standard yet, whereas std optional is. So this paper applies to std optional, but it's based on a, a blog post by, by the author, Cybrand, who originally wrote about monadic operations for std optional and expected. And he has every intention of writing a parallel proposal for expected if and when it actually gets into the standard. The approach in this paper is exactly the same in both cases. So where it says std optional here, you can replace that with std expected. The meaning is the same. What does it give us? Let's have a look at the abstract. It says, I propose adding transform and then and or else member functions to std optional or std expected to support this monadic style of programming. And we'll look at what that style of programming is in a moment. But we've got these three operations that he wants to add. Transform, and then, and or else. Now, if you are familiar with functional programming, or have used any other uh, FP languages, you may recognize these as, well, transform as map, and and then as bind. And anything that forms a monad can support these operations. Um, Look at what they do in a moment, but what about the or else? Well, in the context of error handling, because this is where all the errors get collected, like the, the logic will get short-circuited and passed on to the or else block, you can think of that as being like the catch. Let's see how this actually works in practice. So go back to the example that we were looking at before with our nesting. How would this look with those monadic operations if they were on stood expected? Something like this. Let me just show you that again. So from here down to here. Okay. It's a bit wider, but it's definitely a lot, a lot less code. More importantly, once you get used to this style, the flow of the code is now much more obvious and straightforward. Input goes in at the top, goes to the next line, goes to the next line. In each case, it's unwrapped. You don't actually have to do the unwrapping or the checking yourself. Everything gets filtered off to the end. You'd have a dot or else if you wanted to do some special handling. In this case, we're just returning it. So I think that's a big improvement. Getting a long way there. But it's still a lot of boilerplate. We've got these and then and transform methods. We've got the, the lambda syntax. It's, it's not bad, but it's not great either. Bear in mind what this is up against which is what we can do today with traditional exceptions in C++. Same example would look like this. Then let me show you that again. So from here, which is the bleeding edge of next, next, next generation C++, based on a proposal that hasn't been written yet that applies to another proposal that hasn't been accepted yet, guesses this far, up against what we have today. How, how can it be an improvement? What's the problem with exceptions? Why do we need something different? Well, that was mostly the subject of my previous talk. Optional is not a failure. So I'm not going to go into it in depth here. If you want to find out more, see that. But just in summary, problems with exceptions that some people have are performance on the error path, um, determinism, particularly on the error path, use of RTTI, use of heap allocations, um, and in many cases, uh, image size bloat. And these particularly apply to certain groups of people, uh, embedded, real-time, 
audio, that sort of thing, games. They're all really interested in alternate error handling strategies. But even everyday programmers um, sometimes run into these things. And the other thing, which I haven't mentioned, is the visibility of control flow, which you lose with exceptions. Exceptions can pretty much propagate from anywhere. You have to really carefully check the code all the way to the bottom to really be sure you know where exceptions are coming from, unless you see an except in there. It's still fairly rare. So visibility in, in the code is also an issue. All right, but we were talking about P0709, this magical proposal from Herb Sutter, or swift error handling for C++, if you like. How would this example look like with that? That's the, the real question. Ready? There is. Again, that's exceptions today. This is static exceptions, P0709. Um, we'll, we'll drill into exactly what the differences are in a minute. Just suffice to say, it's very small. Um, that try keyword there is probably the biggest thing you would have noticed. That's actually an optional part of this proposal. Um, that doesn't need to be part of the proposal. It may not get in. We'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. So very little overhead syntactically compared to exceptions today. But here's the key thing, which we'll drill into more in the second part of this talk. All those problems that we just talked about with classic exceptions don't apply here. This is much more like, in fact, it's almost isomorphic to using something like stood expected instead. In fact, it's better than that, as we'll see in a moment. All right, let's um, drill into this a little bit more. So looking at the, um, the function example, so now you can see we've got this froze keyword at the top. This is not the same, not to be confused with the deprecated and now removed uh, throw modifier we could put up there, although it's, there's some similarities. First of all, this is statically checked. So if, if you miss it in the wrong place, the compiler will tell you. Um, but also, again, you can think of it as standing in for, instead of returning an integer, returning a, an, uh, a stood expected of int and some error type. We'll look at the error type in a moment. So it's doing a bit more for us. Then we have the throw itself. Looks much like the throw that we're familiar with, um, but in the context of a function that's marked throws, it takes on a slightly different meaning. Um, you're actually returning, you're effectively returning stuff up the stack, and it's the value type. So it's like throw by value on the stack. Again, we'll, we'll look at that a bit more in a moment. Uh, and again, we'll also look at the, the error type in a moment. And then that try keyword. So I mentioned this before as being an optional part of the proposal. I want to be clear about that, though, because I've had questions about this and realized I hadn't been clear enough. When I say it's an optional part of the proposal, I mean you can have the proposal without it, and many are arguing for that. And if we do, then we don't have it at all. But if it is in the proposal, then you have to use it here, and it's checked by the compiler. In fact, that's the whole point of it, because the compiler doesn't need this. It, this can all work without it. But by having it there and checked by the compiler, it forces you to annotate your code to make those uh, control uh, flows explicit. So you can look at the code, you can see I can, I can tell that control flow may change there. That's the thing I need to pay attention to. We don't have that with exceptions today. I think that's really valuable. In fact, we seem to be neatly divided into two camps on this. There's those that think this is possibly the most important part of this proposal, and this is what we really want yesterday. And there's those that won't touch it when this is in it. They don't want anything to do with it. There are a number of reasons for that. I don't want to try and paint a whole group as having the same motivations, but one thing I do come across a lot is this belief that we can't have it because in C++, almost any line of code can throw. So we're just going to have try on every line of code. It's going to be noise. It will have no purpose. It will just clutter the code. And if that was the case, that would be a, a really fair um, objection. And I would agree with it. The point is that's not the case. But to understand why it's not the case, you have to read the whole proposal and entertain lots of um, parts in it that themselves may also be optional and see how they may play out. Um, we'll look at a bit of that a bit later. 
I'm not going to go into that too much depth. But suffice to say that with this proposal, if we take the whole thing, we wouldn't expect to see this everywhere. Just in those places where you have this ex very sort of explicit like um, error handling, not things like out of memory or things that really should be contracts that are common examples of misuse of exceptions. We'll look at that a bit more later. Let's uh, just scale back a little bit more. If you have one of these, let's assume we have the try keyword, um, within a, a function, if you're not catching it, you have to mark that function throws. Again, statically checked by the compiler. So people think of this as checked exceptions. In a way, it is. But checked exceptions has become a bit of a dirty word because of the failed experiment in C++ um, in, in the 90s, uh, and also uh, because of where Java has, has got come unstuck with its checked exceptions. Mostly because, A, the dynamic nature of the checking, and B, the fact that checked exceptions that we've tried before tend to be uh, type-checked, as in you're checking for a specific type. And that makes the interfaces very brittle. You end up just winding it back down to some sort of base type. You, you lose a lot of the value. Here, we're talking about values, value types, of a single type. It's either froze or it's not. And that turns out to be much more useful. Um, again, you may have to just indulge me on that. So that's if you don't have a try catch. If you do, it works just as you might expect, um, except that we're catching this uh, stood error type. We're going to discuss that in much more depth in a moment. Uh, but for now, yeah, try catch. You can use that before. You can also catch what we might call dynamic exceptions alongside these new type of exceptions if you're, if you're calling different types of code. Um, and then, of course, if, you, if you're doing that, you can mark it no accept as before. Now, if we move into this brave new world, you might actually be able to make a, a coding guidelines rule that every function should be either no accept or froze. We'd still have the, the unadorned type, um, but we wouldn't necessarily need it. OK. Before we drill into what stood error is, I just want to emphasize one point I sort of alluded to earlier. But let's bring it all together. All these keywords I've just introduced, or new meanings for old keywords, are effectively isomorphic to the equivalents using stood expected. So where we see froze, we can, the compiler could effectively rewrite that to something like stood expected of our type and this stood error type. When we see the throw, that's effectively doing a make, uh, return make unexpected. And the try and catch, well, there are and then transform or, or else monadic operators. Or they're standing in for the, um, that big sort of if else nested block. You can think of this whole exercise as just being syntactic sugar around something like stood expected. And I keep saying something like because it's not exactly what the compiler does. It's a useful model, but the compiler can go further. Because it knows it's using this for error handling and it's always on the return channel, it can make more aggressive optimizations. For example, um, with stood expected, there's a whole word in there that's dedicated to just being the discriminant, the thing that says whether it's the type you wanted or the, or the error type. On the return channel, on most architectures, there is a, an unused bit in one of the registers that can be used for that discriminant. So in most cases, there's no size or space overhead for using uh, the, the froze keyword compared to um, just returning the, the original type. Um, the, um, the error type itself, stood error, as we'll see in a moment, is only two words big as well. So between those two things, you can actually move, move this all around in registers very efficiently. So this can actually be much more performant, much more optimal than doing it by hand. So the title of the paper was Zero Overhead Deterministic Exceptions. In some cases, it may actually be negative overhead compared to writing the equivalent by hand, the reasonable equivalent. 
And we have no C++ implementation yet to demonstrate that this is actually the case. And as always, we need to wait for that before we say this is definitely the case. What we do have is Swift, which makes the same optimizations. We do have to be careful about comparing a even equivalent feature from one language to another, even if they're as closely related as Swift and C++. But in this case, I'm fairly confident that that's going to indicate what we'll get out of the C++ version. Anyway, I wanted to talk more about std error. Um, there's, there's a few very interesting properties in this type. So of course, there is another proposal. This is one of the uh, supporting proposals for P0709. In fact, it's right in the, the title there. Um, it says it's for P0709, zero overhead deterministic exceptions. So when you read that, you think, well, the only reason for this paper is to support P0709. It's not useful on its own. Actually, it's not quite the right reading. That's what I need to read from here. It's the standard error object that P0709 uses, but it's also useful on its own. In fact, the first bit says it's the uh, SG14 status code and standard error object. This came out of a discussion on the SG14 study group. That's the, the group for uh, low latency um, designs. Um, let's have a look at the start of the proposal. It says it's a proposal for the replacement in new code of the system header system error with a substantially refactored and lighter weight design, which meets modern C++ design and implementation. Doesn't sound terribly exciting. It's a refinement on something we already had. But this, this came out of a discussion in the SG14 study group around this system header system error, which actually turns out to be really underutilized. Um, not very well known, um, but did have a few problems. They've now fixed these in this proposal, supposedly. So who here is familiar with the system error header? Three hands. Or um, I think stood error code is the main type in there. Right. That's the direction as you get. Not many people. It's been with us since C++ 11, and it's another error handling type that is actually really useful. So to understand std error, we actually need to go back. Oh, actually, before we get to that, I should comment on this slide. This is what std error actually is, according to the proposal. It's a using alias for error status code, erased system code value type. So we clear that up. Now we know what that is. All right, that might need a bit of unpacking. We'll come back to that. As I say, to really understand it, we first need to go back to C++11 and look at std error code. It's a little bit confusing when the types are so similarly named with the same sort of responsibilities, um, but they're actually very different. So the C++11 type is std error code. The new one being proposed, or the alias, is std error. So what's the error code? Well, here's a sketch. Uh, so just the, the, the states, basically. has an integer and a pointer to something called an error category. That's it. Then a bunch of methods. So remember I said earlier that std error, which is based on this, fits in two words. So you can see that fairly clearly there, I hope. So this fits into um, two registers. So there's a load of methods. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I just want to highlight a, uh, well, four of them. Starting with just the accessors, nothing terribly complex about those, just basic accessors. We can get the integer out. Uh, we can get the category out by reference, but other than that, it's just a, a, uh, an accessor. So those are obviously important. And then we have a message, which is a string, and a Boolean operator. Okay. Where's the string coming from? There's no string in the, in the state, so it must be somewhere in the error category. All right, we'll, we'll get to that. What about this Boolean operator? That looks really useful. A type that can represent errors 
I must have to test it by using the Boolean operator to see whether it was an error or not. Unfortunately not. What it actually means is, is the integer <coughs> excuse me, in value zero or not? Which, depending on what your error category is, as we'll see in a moment, may or may not mean it's an error. So unless you really, really know exactly what this is, that's almost completely useless or, at worst, dangerous. Don't use it unless you really know what you're doing. And most people don't. All right, so what's the error category? This is the interesting part. So an error category you can think of as like a domain for errors, where the, the errors are some you know, set of integer values, usually represented as an enum. You know, they don't have to be, but there's no reason for them not to be. So one, when you get out of the box is uh, RC. You saw that earlier. It's actually a complete list of, well, I don't know about complete, but it's a list of POSIX error codes. Most, if not all, of the POSIX error codes are in the C++11 standard. Not everyone knows that as well. Whether or not you use error code, you can use this. So that's one enum. But you might want to create you know, your own domain for errors, like this one I've got up here, another enum. Some of the values may or may not be the same. They're distinguished by the error category that's associated with them. So the error category doesn't hold the enum but it's the thing that tells you what the enum means. Does that make sense? All right. <clears throat> if you create your own error category, you have to create your own error category class, which is a polymorphic class derived from std error category. And again, it has a set of virtual methods that you can override. Um, most of them are not so interesting tonight, so I want to uh, emphasize these ones. First of all, that message. That's where that comes from. So we just pass the integer in, gives you back a string. Now we know that it's just mapping to enums. You can say, well, I could just do a, a switch statement or a, or a map or whatever you want to do to convert that integer via an enum into a string. That will work. Do, do what makes sense. More interesting are these equivalent methods. What do they do? Notice we've got, um, as well as error code, there we've also got error condition. We haven't talked about error condition yet, for good reason. It's exactly the same as error code, except it's a different type. And because it's a different type, you can use overloading here to get the right type of equivalence. Now, it turns out to be really useful, because when you're comparing errors, you may want to compare them just within the same domain or category. Or you may want to say, is this error in this category equivalent to this error in this category? And you might have one-to-one -one relationships or one-to-many relationships. And that's what these equivalence methods are for, to allow you to do that mapping. This is actually really powerful. Now think for a moment about um, exception hierarchies. Classic OO inheritance hierarchies. You've got a nice sort of tree structure. That can be quite useful for, for grouping and categorizing errors, but it has some limitations. It's very one directional. This actually can give you much more flexible mappings between errors. Might be a bit more fine grained to, to implement, but when you need it, this is really powerful. Because you can say one value over here actually maps to multiple values over there, for example. It's really useful. The downside is, as I said, to get this behavior, you need to introduce a separate type that does the same thing. It gets confusing. Even the experts get this wrong. It's actually quite hard to, to use correctly. And quite hard to, unless you know exactly what you're doing, do it right. So again, it doesn't get a lot of use, which is unfortunate, because it sets a really powerful feature. OK, so we, we talked about those. We've highlighted a couple of the problems already, and also some of the, the power of this type. Remember, this is the old C++11 type. Here's the, um, all the, the set of problems that SG14 found, some we've looked at. So the first one, those category um, classes, they have an identity, and that identity is defined by their pointer value. When you compare two error codes, 
to see whether they have the same error category, you look at the pointer values. It's really convenient, but it does imply that categories must be singletons, because they have to have the same address. That becomes a problem if you have a single header library within a dynamic library. Because now each dynamic library can have a different address for the same sing uh, single header, or sorry, header only singleton. And that might sound like an edge case. And it is, but it's an edge case that get hit, gets hit a lot, apparently. So that's a problem. It's been identified. Depends on std string. What's the problem with that? Std string is a very common standard type. It's been with us since C++ 98. Shouldn't you be using that everywhere? The problem with std string is it turns out to be quite a heavyweight dependency. Pulls in locales and actually exceptions as well, which we're probably trying to get away from. Bear in mind, this is the type that's often used in places that can't use exceptions or need to keep footprint down as small as possible. So being a heavyweight dependency turns out to be a problem. This is a showstopper for some people. OK. We talked about the Boolean conversion not being reliable and the, the separate error condition type. Um, it's C++11 library. Const expro was very minimal at the time and also very new. So there's no const expert in this. It's a shame because pretty much all of it or most of it could be. The, the error code has to be something that can be mapped into an integer. Find free nums, but what if we wanted to put something else in there? Can't do that. And, OK, little point, but I had to explain that an error category was like a domain for errors. So why not just call them an error domain? Minor thing. All right, that's the problems that SG14 found with std error code. How does std error address those? Let's look at the equivalent sketch. So it's a template called status code. That's the status code from the title. Usually, that E type is some integral type. Could be an enum, usually. Uh, but now it's actually type safe as well. Um, and we've got status code domain. Yeah, fixes the problem with the naming, maybe a little bit clearer. Other than that, basically the same. OK. So here's the using alias we looked at earlier. We've got error status code there. So that immediately doesn't match up. We've got status code versus error status code. What's the difference? Well, a really simple difference. Error status code is the same as status code, but it's always an error. A status code may represent a non-error code, success code, if you like. That's when you might need to check. With error status code, you never need to check if it's an error, because it's always an error. And that's um, enforced in the constructor. So if you've got one of these, it has to be an error. You don't have to check. So you don't need that Boolean operator. In fact, this one doesn't have it, because it was useless anyway. So if you do have a, a raw status code and you need to check, you actually have to check the, the code itself. But for our purposes, in terms of std error, it's always the error version. So we're fine. OK. What about this second part? Erased suggests some sort of type erasure type. And that's exactly what it is. So this is the type that sets aside memory for some other value to be placed in there. And the size of that memory is its template argument, which in this case, see, did I? I think I highlighted it here is system code value type, which turns out to be in pointer t. We go. So we have a type erase type with storage set aside the size of int pointer t. That's significant because it still fits in a word, but now we can put integers in there, we can put enums in there, and we can put pointers in there. That means this thing can hold, say, exception pointers, which turns out to be really useful for our purposes. We'll come back to that. That means, effectively, std error is like this, if we expand that all out. We've got our status code domain and some storage the size of an int pointer t that we might put something else in that the status code domain knows about. It's having to interpret that anyway, so it's opaque to the outside. And whatever is in there 
Never success. We don't need to check. So that we can see how that fixes some of the problems straight away. Let's have a look at the rest. Well, domains are called domains, fine. That singleton problem that goes away because rather than using the pointer value of the domain, each one has a randomly generated uint64t, and that's randomly generated at design time. You generate it once, you put it in the code. The, the proposal even gives you the pointer to the tool you can use. To guarantee they're going to be cryptographically unique. So we use these rather than pointers. Safe to use the singletons. The value type could be any small, trivially copyable or movable type. I'm going to drill into what that means in a moment. But basically anything that can fit into an in pointer T that has these properties. Has no string dependency, as currently proposed. I say that hesitantly because what it does do is it defines its own string type. I'm not sure that's going to last. A new error type that defines its own string type to get away from the, the stood string dependency. But it is quite a big problem for some people. So probably what will happen is that will be split out and we'll have, because it's called uh, string, string ref, I think. Maybe we'll have some separate paper that will propose that lightweight string um, that we can use. We'll see what happens. But it's mostly context, bro, as it should be. Doesn't have the do Boolean conversion, as we said. And now they made the design choice that comparison is always for equivalence. So we don't need this separate type to overload on. We just do an equals equals, and it always means equivalent. If you want to do a bitwise comparison, you just use the accesses and you compare the state manually. Almost never happens. Almost always want equivalence. So that basically fixes all those problems while retaining all of that, the power that that type had that most people are not even aware of. So I think this would be really useful driving forward just adoption of this concept alone, even if separate from P0709. Remember, this is the type that P0709 throws and catches. So it fits into two registers. And then there's this bit about being trivially copyable or movable. And my pointer's not acting very well. Sorry about that. All right, so it's in two CPU registers. That's easy to understand. But it's got this caveat. If move implies memcopy, that's what this trivially movable really boils down to. So you're probably aware of the trivially copyable uh, trait which means that copies can be implemented in terms of memcopy, but it doesn't apply to move-only types. And you might want to put a move-only type in here, um, like a unique pointer or something like that. So this is a, a, an important concept. But we don't have this concept in the, the, uh, the standard right now. Nothing in the standard that says anything about being trivially movable. It's also quite hard to say. So. There's another proposal. This is P1029, SG14 move relocates. And there's a parallel paper, P1144, object relocation in terms of move plus destroy. Why two papers? Best to consider them side by side. So P1029, very simple. It just introduces an attribute that indicates that a move operation is trivial, i.e. it can be performed in terms of memcopy, like trivially copyable. And that's it, just defines the attribute. That's enough for our purposes to make std error trivially movable in all cases. We can just annotate it. Done. P1144 is a bit more ambitious. It also has this attribute, although it is an optional part of the proposal. But it also has the detection trait is Trivially copyable, I think it's called. Um, it's got some algorithms. It actually defines the relocatable concept, which I say is not in the standard right now. But the most interesting part in, this, in the middle, it can reset the moved from state, also using memcopy. So the idea is you've got a type, you want to move out of it, you default construct a new version and memcopy from there in to give you your reset state. 
how it defines it. Sounds great, except that makes this what we call destructive move. And destructive move has had a long and torturous history through the, the Standards Committee over many years. So far, every proposal that's brought it up has been shot down. So there's a little bit of caution around whether this will get accepted because of that. As a result, if it doesn't, we have P1029 to fall back on. I'm sure there's a neater way to combine these two and, and still have that fall back, but that's where we are right now. We're rooting for P1144, which is still going through. So far, so good. But we have P1029 in our back pockets, just in case. One way or another, we should get that, that concept, and that will allow us to make stood error movable uh, via registers, which is that, that important con uh, concept that allows us to get the maximum level of optimization out of something like P10, sorry, 0709. Or even just using std error on its own will benefit from this. So that is std error. Hopefully, I've emphasized why a bit of a deep dive into that type uh, is useful. Even if we don't get a std error, at least now you know about std error code which is still useful despite its flaws. So we have looked at a number of proposals. P10709, uh, static exceptions, what most people are calling it, because zero of their deterministic exceptions throwing values doesn't quite roll off the tongue. Um, that's the, the, the master proposal. Then the supporting proposals, P1028, stood error, and then the two uh, move relocation proposals. They're the main ones, but then we also looked at stood expected as a lead background, and the magnetic operations on, for now, stood optional, for stood expected will come. And then an honorable mention to the ill-fated P0542, support for contracts, which was going into C++20 until last summer in Cologne, where they got removed because nobody can actually agree on what they were. Um, work is still underway to, to get that in, hopefully, to 23. But we don't know exactly what that's going to look like yet. But there is a lot of interest in getting contracts into the standard. What's that got to do with the um, error handling that we're talking about tonight? I sort of alluded to it earlier when I said that one of the reasons that people object to that try keyword in P0709 is because they see exceptions everywhere. But it turns out that many cases of exceptions right now, certainly in the standard library and in most many um, code bases, should actually be contracts. They are contract violations. In fact, anything that says logic error or is derived from logic error really should be a contract or should be changed with different exceptions. Like in fact, it's been said that stood logic error is itself a logic error because it's not recoverable. Exceptions should be recoverable. They're indicating contract violations. Now, of course, there's a whole argument about whether contracts should be allowed to throw, but that's discussion for another time. Point is, once you take things that should be contracts off the table, aside from your few uses of exceptions, most of the rest are going to be possible bad alex. Haven't gone into that tonight. I went into it a bit in my previous talk, but that's a whole big other subject. A big part of the proposal, optional part of the proposal is, what if we don't throw an exception for heap exhaustion, at least by default? Which, on the face of it, sounds really controversial, and then you dig into it, and you think, actually, that makes a lot of sense. Because in many cases, we can't defend against heap exhaustion in the same way that we can't defend against st stack overflow. I mean, we can try to minimize it happening, but we can't really recover from it. Now, usually there are objections say, yeah, but we do. Most of the time, you're wrong. The few cases that you are, yes, there, there are cases, and there will still be ways to handle that. We're not saying you can never detect heap exhaustion. But it shouldn't be that almost any method that you call may throw because it may run out of, of heap. When in fact, most of the time, like 99.999% of the time, it doesn't. And if it did, you wouldn't be able to recover from it anyway. And in, even then, 
if you run out of memory, you may not get the exception, or you may not get the error. At the point you run out, you may get it when you actually try to use the memory. So you weren't handling it anyway. And in fact, uh, Herb Sutter has, has done a really good follow-up to this, where he, he did some experiments and showed that even the people you would have thought, well, they're definitely memory safe, but they're not. So it's a really interesting thread to pull on, that we took bad alloc out of the picture as well, and contracts. What's left? Just a really small number of error handling cases where you really do want to know what the control flow is. So leave you with that thought. One more thing before we wrap up. There's one more proposal. Not a proposal, it's a paper by um, uh, Bjarne Straustrup himself. After P0709 was first presented in um, Cologne last summer, there was a lot of activity on the uh, internal mailing list for the, for the committee. And he put it all together into this paper. C++ exceptions and alternatives. And probably the headline is that it recommends against adding new error handling me mechanisms to C++. So Bjarne is currently against it. And not just him, this is actually represents a number of influential people in the committee. So not looking good so far. But there's also a lot of support for it. And this is not over by any means. But even if this is where it ends, the next sentence is encouraging. It encourages careful studies of improved error handling styles and techniques. It encourages study of potential improvements in the implementation of existing C++ exceptions. So he's actually encouraging active, careful work in an area that's basically been stagnating for the last two or three decades. If nothing else comes out of this other than this, that will be a positive result. But personally, I'm still hoping that static exceptions will, or something like it, will actually come through. We're only at the start of this. It's been presented in one meeting in evolution. Uh, so it could take a while to, to boil. But it, this talk wouldn't be complete without showing this paper. So I'll put that on there as well. And that completes my talk, um, other than to say that all the references, proposals, previous talks, and everything can be found on my website, levelofindirection.com uh, slash refs slash dawn.html. So just one URL to get them all. If you can't remember levelofindirection.com, I also have extra levelofindirection.com that redirects there, as well as too many levels of indirection.com, but that went a bit too far. And here's all the proposal numbers, in case you wanted those as well. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil, very much. Uh, so if you have questions, just key to the mics in the center of the hall, and you're free to ask whatever you want. But preferably about error handling. Come on. <laughs> Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I should say I really like the uh, titles of your of your talks, uh, the wordplay behind them. I have two questions, if I may. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, uh, will this? I'll adjust it a bit. Ah. Will this uh, new keyword throws uh, replace the no throw? You mentioned they are kind of mutually exclusive. Uh, I mean, a function either throws or it doesn't. Uh, will it at some point make the no throw obsolete? Um, no throw is already obsolete, as in it's been removed from the standard. Um, I, I, met, I brought that up because I said don't, don't confuse it with that which was used in the same position. Um, no, no, I, I mean not not uh, throw. Uh, uh, sorry, yes. No throw, like up. like the structures. Or, and stuff. But yeah, no throw has been replaced by no accept already. Um, what I did say was that um, in a world where we have static exceptions, you should be able to write any function either no accept or froze. And that it's always explicit whether or not it propagates an error. Um, so at that point, you wouldn't need anything else, but obviously we still have to interoperate with a legacy world, unless we get something like epochs or something like that. That's a whole other talk, which I don't give. 
Mm -hmm. um, although I do have a related talk. But yeah, in interoperability messes things up a bit, although I didn't really cover it tonight. There is a, an interoperability story between classic exceptions and static exceptions if you can get them to work together. Um, but yeah, we, we will have to still exist with a world where you have things like no throw or nothing at all and um, have to know what that means. But writing new code, you would only write um, throws or no accept, and you could probably have tools that would check for that. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Or the first question? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, very, very thorough response. Uh, I confused. Uh, no accept, I meant, of course. Uh, and the, the second uh, question uh, about this uh, uh, stood uh, error. We, uh, in, with, with the current exceptions, we have like kind of pattern matching. Uh, but a stood error, it, 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 it's only one thing. Uh, I mean, uh, if we get it, we have to figure out what it is. Like in dynamically typed languages, yeah. it kind of erases the pattern matching and reminds uh, the C-ish uh, style of handling errors. Will it be some kind of uh, templated stood error or some more advanced pattern matching planned? Thank you. Yes. So few things. First of all, I didn't really show how you actually inspect std error. Um, but going back a bit, you, you mentioned that exceptions today act more like pattern matching. And they do, but only a very specific form of pattern matching, which is pattern matching for the dynamic type of something, which is actually part of the problem because of the expense of that. That's what uses RTTI. It's a, as if you had written, you know, if dynamic cast this or if dynamic cast that. Um, whereas what we have is just basically a set of integer values. We can actually do a switch on it, except we can't today because, well, when I say today, with today's compiler, because, um, because std error has this equals operator to do equivalence, you can't use that in a switch statement today. So you'd have to do a series of if elses. But completely parallel and orthogonal to this, we do have a patent, full pattern matching proposal going through quite nicely, which is probably on track to maybe even beat um, static exceptions if we ever get it into the standard. So by that point, we may actually have a fully fledged pattern matching that could do, in a very similar way to a switch statement, uh, a match of stood errors against other stood errors or um, diff from different domains with all the equivalents built in as well. So yes is the answer, just maybe not in quite the way you, you meant. Thank you. Welcome. Anyone else? I think you need to queue for the, for the mic if you want to. Can you switch, please, to the 83rd slide? This one? Yes. Uh, in the line where uh, uh, we assign try at one, why do we use try operator only once? Right, yes. Good catch, if you pardon the pun. Uh, I glossed over that. So this is called a try expression, and it applies to a whole expression, which could be a compound expression. You don't have to put try in front of every call that may throw, only the expression that may yield an error. Does that cover you? So you should only see it once per line, if at all, as a rule. Okay. Sorry, we got there in the end. <laughs> Thank you for your speech. It was <laughs> really, really new, really fresh. Um, as a person who involved in the old uh, project with a lot of legacy code, mm -hmm. so my question was, you are speaking about a kind of revolution in the error handling, error processing, and so on. Uh, will, uh, well, uh, when we, could have this revolutionary code, uh, when we could write it and could compile. Uh, will the new compiler, uh, will, uh, it can, be, uh, will new compiler have a backward compatibility with okay. the old and fashioned and old fashioned codes, uh, which we, we have a lot of old code, we have a lot of legacy code, which shall be maintained somehow. So absolutely, first of all, 
Um, what this is proposing is a, a new feature that can be used alongside existing features and can interoperate with them. So that's one thing I glossed over. Um, if, if you have a dynamic exception, classic exception, propagates into a function marked throws and you only have a catch std error, it can actually put it inside a std error because remember std error can hold an exception pointer. You can treat it as a std error. Going the other way, if you have a, uh, a traditional function that calls something marked throws, it can catch that as a uh, an except dynamic exception type or wrap it. So yeah, the wrapping and unwrapping is extra overhead. You want to avoid it if you can, but you generally know worse off than you were in the classic exception days. So you, you will be able to interoperate um, as well. Um, but the idea is that you know, moving forward, you write all your new code with um, static exceptions. Now, I did bring up something orthogonal, which was epochs, which is another proposal going through at the moment, for which slim chance it will actually make it through, but I'm, I'm hopeful. I don't know if you looked at epochs, but this is a way of um, being able to drop backwards compatibility in certain parts of your code base so we can actually start to clean the language up. If we get that, that actually may be a, a candidate for, for epochs to say, in this epoch, to find at the top of your file, um, we're not going to actually have dynamic exceptions at all. So you know, no need for interoperability or so on. But then you are in control of that. That's the only time, well, unless we're looking at maybe 100 years in the future, that we'll ever drop classic exceptions. So you're quite safe. This is just purely a, um, an addition that gives you something better. Um, and hopefully you can rewrite, not necessarily rewrite, but update some of your code to take advantage of it. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Phil. Thank you for your talk. I, I have a little question about uh, status code. You m mentioned that uh, one of the problems is a dependency on stud-string. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that uh, a custom implementation of string is considered, and I'm, I don't understand because a classic solution for that is to use char const, char const because it's uh, understood by operation systems APIs and it's used in source location, in uh, char conversion functions and all of that stuff. Why we can't use a char const in this case? So if you're going to use char star, you may as well use string view which is everything that Charstar was plus the, the length as well, so it's a little bit better. But it doesn't give you any own, ownership semantics. It doesn't actually tell you who owns the, the memory. It doesn't own anything itself. Yes. Uh, in, in either case. So I think, I haven't actually looked into uh, Niall's um, proposed string ref um, to know what it says about ownership. It sounds like it's non-owning, um, but I know there's something else different about it. String view wasn't enough, yeah. uh, neither was Charstar. I don't remember the details of why, but okay. I think it has to do with ownership. A little cl clarification. The string view has the same problems as to string because it's a yes. he heavy, heavy dependency. It, exa exactly. That, that's my point. It has the same problem. Yes. It's just slightly better because it also has the size. And it's not really better for uh, performance reasons be because, again, uh, operation system doesn't understand what, no, no, what the no. heck is str string view. Um, but it does also it does say something about ownership. He says, I don't own it, <laughs> okay. which is not yes. there with, with Charstar. It's okay. not Th obvious. Thank you for the answer. Welcome. Any other questions? Or shall we break for is the food? Yeah, here? we have food already arrived, so we can maybe handle a couple of questions mm -hmm. if you still have some and then move to private chats with the food. <laughs> OK, any more? Any more questions? Doesn't have to be about error handling. Uh, thank you for the talk. Okay. Uh, so, uh, looking on the uh, syntax, I see uh, two things. Uh, first is a way to uh, annotate a function with a special uh, keyword. And the second is uh, annotating an expression with a keyword. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the, there is already at least one uh, proposal that uses uh, similar uh, techniques. It's uh, coroutines. Uh, so my question right. is, 
Am I right in thinking that uh, this proposal and coroutines are similar and uh, use a similar um, mechanism to uh, propagate uh, information of the stack? Very good observation. Uh, coroutines are another example of monads baked into the language for a particular application. Uh, and that's the trouble. There have already been people proposing to abuse coroutines to do other monadic things, including error handling, because they are a way of rewriting the code in this monadic way. Um, the trouble is that's not what they were designed for, and in particular, none of the, the naming matches, and some of the semantics were a bit mismatched as well. So you can do it, but it's, you're sort of on your own. It's better to well, either have a purely generic monadic feature in the language, which is something else that's been on the, on the back burner as a proposal. Um, hasn't really been pushed actively, but that would be nice if we had a, a general way, like uh, Haskell. Haskell just has a way of dealing with monads, and whatever monad you, you need to deal with, you can just do it with a generic mechanism. I'm not sure that's ever going to be the complete answer in C++, because one of our objectives with C++, maybe the key objective, is to always do things in the most um, optimal way. You know, that, that zero overhead principle, even in the title of the, the proposal, zero overhead, overhead. Whereas a purely uh, generic mo monad uh, feature would probably have some overhead because of its gener generality. That's why we have co-routing specifically and why we're proposing uh, these so-called static exceptions. Uh, and then we have other examples of monads. Um, can't think of off the top of my head, but um, where we are proposing specific implementations so that we can do it in a way that the compiler can aggressively optimize for, because that's what we want from the language. Um, so yeah, we can see the monads behind the, the things, but um, while a generic monadic feature would be nice, it probably won't be the complete answer. I could be wrong there, but that's my feeling from, from what I've looked at. Does that answer your question? Or did you have a slight variation on that? <laughs> we can always talk afterwards. Do we have any other questions? Or did I scare everyone off talking about monads? Okay, let, not, let us well all enough. thank you once again for the great talk and like welcome everyone for food and private chats with Phil. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>